I often said that the child had 66 vision, 2020 vision, no significant refractive error. The child is normal. So the mother still feels that okay, is there anything really like you know going on with my child's eye and vision? Like why is my child still not like why is my child struggling to read? So I'm going to do a small quick poll now. So what I want you to do is go over to your browser, like you can open up another browser and just type in this website that I have put www.menti.com. So I'm going to show you how to do this. Okay, so I want like participation from everybody, whoever that's joined from both uh, uh, YouTube as well as Zoom. So just want you guys to so just uh, if you can see my screen you will see this uh, menti.com and then so you have to go there and then type this code 57484537 okay 57484537 so just go to this website and then type this code and then say submit and you will see a screen and you will see this screen in front of you so for those of you who want the code, it is there on top of the screen also. So I want you to go into the website, go into this uh, browser and then use this code. So now we saw this eight year old child who has difficulty with say, you know, academics, difficulty writing down, copying from blackboard. So just uh, what are your thoughts? You can, you can click any number of options, but just click an option, okay? What, what do you think is relevant at this point of time? Okay. Uh, maybe you can uh, explain the options uh, there a yeah. more little bit to understand the, those okay. people, participants. Sure. So, so now that this child has got uh, six by six vision, will you tell the parent that the child has normal eye health? Okay. Will you tell the parent, okay, everything is fine? Or will you advise for binocular vision testing? Or will you advise for visual perceptual testing? Or will you say this child needs referral for further assessment regarding IQ, may need to see an occupational therapist, a psychologist or a physical therapist. So what will you advise? Okay. So you can choose more than one option. What will you do as a practitioner? What will you, if you want to, for example, if you think that, okay, this is normal, you can choose the first option. If you think, no, no, I will do a PV testing, you will choose the second option. If you think, you know, I want to do a binocular vision test, plus I will also make a referral, you can choose two options. So whatever that works for you, you can choose. Yeah, so the link is there in the chat box as well. So please click that link and then use the code. Yeah, I think slowly, gradually we are having uh, Yeah, yeah, people are, they take time. First time that they come in, they will take no problem. Let them come because after you do this, don't just keep the browser open, okay? Because I'll have the next, I have two more polls. So keep the browser open once you do this testing. But now you can see on the screen that 43% uh, response is more for visual perceptual testing followed by binocular vision testing. And 14% is like, okay, maybe I will tell that the child has normal eye health. And some feel that the child will need detailed psychoeducational assessment. You know? So this is how the current split is. Uh, so you can ask, you keep thinking about, so what I'm going to do is uh, I don't want to exceed the time. So I'm going to go over to my PowerPoint. So first thing is we have to dig a little bit deep into the birth history of this child because uh, because developmental uh, milestones are very important for us to understand, okay, are there any other complications? So what we did is, uh, the first thing is, this is the first and only child born preterm at 28 weeks of gestation. 
and then the child had some neonatal respiratory distress the child didn't cry well after birth was admitted in the neonatal icu for almost one week the child's birth weight was 2.5 kilograms the rest of the birth history was normal but after the child like after it was born uh, at, until like around, around one year of age the child had sort of seizures like episodes like you know jerks and then the child underwent some mri brain where they found that there was a subdural hygroma in the left middle perineal fossa and the child's anterior temporal lobe was small sized and the mother said uh, the child's developmental milestones are a little bit delayed at around one year but as you see like if you see the child child looked apparently more or less normal except for the fact that the child had um, acad more academic difficulties okay but other otherwise child was walking well speaking well and all that was okay huh? so this is the uh, birth history which you see is like quite alarming okay so immediately this birth history should uh, raise a red flag or oh, am i missing something should i just look beyond visual acuity okay so the next thing i want to talk about is okay now let's get into the diagnostic data so when we did assessment we found that the child had uh, normal visual equities for distance and near but as you see here the child had a large exophoria at near and uh, normal fusion with birth for dot for distance and near stereopsis uh, uh, with global stereopsis was 400 arc seconds and the npc was uh, receded and with, it kept receding with repeated testing the accommodative amplitudes were borderline but it was not like very reduced and the accommodation response was sort of uh, normal okay so at this point uh, we went ahead and also did the uh, fusional virgins amplitudes so for those of you who are not very familiar we use base out and base in prism bars so we use base in prisms to check the negative fusional virgins amplitudes we use base out prisms to check the positive fusional virgins amplitudes so when you test for these virgins amplitudes you will really know how well the uh, eye is able to converge and then the diver and diverge okay so you will know the potential uh, the, the magnitude of the convergence and divergence amplitudes so when we check the near convergence uh, we found that the near convergence amplitudes are a bit reduced so so far as you see here this child has got a uh, 66 vision large exophoria at near and uh, receded npc okay so go over to the same nt.com like i said do not close the screen and i hope that you have not closed the screen and uh, so what i want you to do is again i want more people to participate so please uh, go to that same uh, menti.com and if i ask you now that we have done the binocular vision testing what other investigations do you think you will do okay would you want to do a reading based assessment ocular motor testing visual perceptual testing or what will you do okay so go to again in the chat box you have the website you have the code so please go into the uh, polling website and then click what will you do so hope you are seeing the pattern on the screen like people are saying like some some wants to do all all the test reading ocular motor and visual perceptual testing some want to do ocular motor testing so the the poll is picking up good okay so the majority of you want to do all test so what i'm going to do is go back to the presentation and then yes you're all right we did the reading assessment also we used what we call the read elizer which is an infrared based eye tracker that you, that just like you put the reading glasses and then the infrared glasses and then you give a reading material to the child uh, so because the child is like a you know uh, is 8 years old uh, you can give an age appropriate reading material and ask the child to read 
so as the child reads this uh, this eye tracker is going to look at how uh, good the fixations are and it's going to calculate the reading speed so as you see here the reading speed is 75 words per minute which is definitely very very reduced and uh, so this is a graph that tells you like the uh, the output that tells you the other parameters okay so what we also found that is uh, this child who is supposed to be in, in like grade 3 or grade 4 has only a second grade equivalent reading speed and we also do, did an ocular motor testing. Okay? So when we did an ocular motor testing what we found was we found that the child had uh, difficulty with making saccades and pursuits. So because in, what you do in this uh, uh, NSUCO saccades and pursuits testing is that you check for the ability, the accuracy, the head movements and the body movements. So and then you give a score that goes from one to five. And as you see here, the scores are really low and that tells you that the child's uh, ability to really uh, you know make these voluntary eye movements uh, are really like you know very poor for example if you ask a child to keep uh, rapidly shifting fixation between two objects instead of so ideally what you expect someone to do is to keep the head constant and only use the eyes to rapidly shift from one object to another but in this case the child is also making excessive head and body movements which means the child is putting a lot of uh, relying more on the head and body movements to support uh, the eye movements because the child has very inefficient eye tracking ability and so the child is like doing all these as alternative sort of compensating strategies and so definitely this child has got an ocular motor dysfunction in itself so these are the differential diagnosis at this point like the child could have convergence insufficiency can have an ocular motor visual dysfunction ocular motor dysfunction learning related problem or a cerebral visual impairment so i'm going to concentrate more on the last one which is cerebral visual impairment and uh, so i'm going to introduce you to what is called a dutton's inventory so Dutton's inventory is nothing but uh, it's basically uh, a questionnaire okay that has different questions that test for the ability of the child to perform certain activities of daily living okay so for example it's going to ask you questions like does the child have difficulty navigating in crowded environment does the child bump or trip off from objects that are lying on the floor does the child have difficulty identifying objects in the left side or right side so likewise this inventory is going to have uh, like 48 questions which is going to look at the different visual perceptual difficulties that the child has got and the whole idea is you can access this uh, in this this inventory free online so all you have to do is just go and uh, just go and like type in Dutton's inventory in the website. I'll also share the link in the chat box once my talk is done, where you can just go and run the inventory. And once you finish the inventory, the beauty is that it's going to give you compensatory strategies. For example, this child has difficulty finding the beginning of a line on reading and the child re misses pictures or words. So if you have uh, ticked that this is a problem, then the uh, Dr. Dutton has given strategy. So what you should really do this uh, patient's name, like we have used the initials. So ask master yes to point to each word with his finger. View only one line of a book at any time. And you can use a typoscope or something like that to do this. You can make the font size bigger. You can use double spacing between the lines. So likewise, for every difficulty that, the, that you are picking there, you're also going to get advice as a printout, you can download this from this inventory and you can just sit with the teacher or the parent and tell them exactly what is to be done. Very simple. It's going to give you all the behavioral modifications and environmental modifications that you need to do for these children who have got visual perceptual issues. This is very, very important because it's not only about treating, but also managing managing the child's environment, both in at home and in the school, so that you are also enabling this child to sort of like, for example, if the child has difficulty navigating in a crowded environment, you will give advice as to 
keep the floor free of clutter and not like you know uh, in the child's wardrobe not have 10 dresses and ask the child to go and take one but reduce it like arrange it according to the different colors and things like that make it more neat and clean so that is what is more important for uh, for us to like tell both the parents and teachers because these smaller environmental mod modifications can actually help the child go a long way as you are also dealing with other issues okay suppose if you are a very busy practitioner and you can't like run this 40 plus item questionnaire if you want to screen for these issues then what you can also do is to use a five item questionnaire which is called a short screening survey so these five questions are just listed here so this is the paper that talks about validity of the five questions you ask the child whether it has difficulty walking downstairs seeing things which are moving quickly seeing something which is pointed like if you ask the child to like uh, if you point out something to an object at distance and ask the child to identify what it is does the child have difficulty identifying it locating a cloth item of clothing in a pile of clothes and difficulty copying words or drawings uh, very time consuming and difficult for the child. So you ask these and do it on a Likert scale. And if the child, of course, uh, you know, if, if you find that the child has problems with any of these, then you can go and run the full uh, inventory. So this is how you really like, you know, start to use these inventories in your practice. You also have another inventory, which is by Arbitus et al, which again talks about, as you see here, uh, these are all like different questions uh, this this survey this inventory has got uh, both issues that are that can be present with binocular vision issues that can be present with any other common vision assessment related and also uh, visual perceptual issues. Okay, so you could use any of the uh, any of these inventories. And so, how do you actually make like what, after you do this, what you do and why you are doing this? What is the condition that we are talking about? Like a child who has a lot of birth related complications, but also has six by six vision. What is this condition that we are dealing with? This is what we call a cerebral visual dysfunction, which is more like cognitive sort of like issues, especially it is present in children who are born premature and who also have postnatal birth related risk factors. So basically all of us know about ocular visual impairment where there is any problem to do with the anterior visual pathway related uh, problems like this from the eye until the brain, until the optic chiasm. But when it comes to retrogeniculate, like post lateral geniculate body, when there are issues which are to do with, for example, the parietal lobes or the temporal lobes, because you know that you don't just have one system that just goes to the occipital cortex, but you also have systems like the dorsal stream and the ventral stream where where after the uh, information reaches the occipital uh, lobe, uh, information related to you know form recognition and things like that goes to one system and information related to movement of the objects goes to the other system. So we're going to talk about these systems in the next slide. So there are also the dorsal and the ventral pathways apart from just the visual pathway that you all know. So these pathways, if they are impaired, so if there are any retrogeniculate uh, you know, sort of uh, problem because of this postnatal uh, birth related complications, then the child can present with cognitive visual dysfunction. And that's what you see here. And then, of course, you have cortical visual impairment, like people used to call this cortical earlier, but by definition, cortical visual impairment means like you have problem at the level of occipital cortex alone. And this child is going to have much more profound levels of visual impairment and not like really like good visual acuity. OK, so. Um, so this is what I was talking about, the dorsal and the ventral stream. So as you see here, once the information reaches the occipital lobe, one pathway goes from the occipital lobe to the parietal lobe. So this is called the occipital parietal pathway. So it, uh, this information goes to the posterior parietal cortex. This is called the dorsal pathway or the wear pathway, which is to do with identification of where the object is located in space, where it is located compared to another object. Is it the right, left, up or down? 
and how do i really navigate objects in the superior visual field inferior visual field and things like that so it's all about navigating your visual environment then there is an there is second pathway which goes from the occipital uh, junction to the temporal uh, lobe which is called the uh, ventral pathway which is also called the watt stream this is to do with the identification like the details of the object so looking at the face oh, what sort of facial recognition am i really seeing so this is the these are children like children who have these temporal lobe issues like this child also had a smaller temporal anterior temporal lobe so this child is going to have issues in identifying different emotions that are seen on the face of the child of the mother or relatives or even face recognition when people are looking are like this child might get confused or identifying the identifying his or her own friend amidst a like group of people so they are going to have difficulty identifying the details of the object in terms of color texture shape and size so it's not that it's not necessarily that you have to have only a visual acuity based impairment but you can also have visual perceptual impairment where it is to do with uh, identifying the uh, uh, you know having difficulties related to movement of objects having difficulty identifying the details of the object and dr datan has this beautiful tree of vision uh, de uh, depiction where if you see here it's like you know this is the fame, this, is, this is the visual pathway that all of us know but beyond <clears throat> your optic chiasm apart from you know information that goes to the occipital lobes from the occipital lobe you have these two branches that goes and then uh, depending upon the issues that the child represents so for example i'll have i'll have a print out of this in my clinic so when the child has for example here let's take this particular case mother said the child has difficulty reading an object so look at this if the child has problem uh, uh, reading a text that's crowded then this is a child that probably has a dorsal stream dysfunction so likewise looking at specific visual uh, complaints whether it's to do with visual search attention or guidance of movement or it is to do with the recognition of an object you can find out which pathway is basically implicated in a child and so basically we are talking about uh, cerebral visual dysfunction especially when uh, children are born premature despite having uh, normal to pretty much normal levels of visual acuity these children can have lots of visual perceptual and learning related visual problems so what we did is of course we did management for convergence and sufficiency we gave both in office and home therapy we also gave therapy for visual perceptual difficulties and we referred the child for a detailed psychoeducational assessment we worked with the special educator and the occupational therapist on fine motor skills development and based on that then inventory we gave modification as how the environment can be modified and the child started to show really very good improvement this is an uh, uh, like the visual uh, from the test for uh, uh, this is from the pts inet the perceptual therapy system where uh, one of the perceptual visual perceptual attributes the visual search for this child is really showing good improvement so basically just to uh, summarize everything cerebral visual impairment represents a spectrum of visual dysfunction high functioning children with cvi can present with apparently normal to uh, you know mild levels of visual impairment but uh, and normal eye health but can have lots of other issues so what is important is to do a detailed functional vision assessment and binocular vision and visual perceptual assessment and you need to work with multidisciplinary team like ot's pts and special educators and uh, moving on to the next case which is the case of an 8 year old uh, child uh, the son of an ophthalmologist and so this child uh, had eye strain for really long time and then the uh, the father who is an ophthalmologist himself checked and then didn't again had child had 66 visual acuity and so he is like you know he took the child to another uh, friend of his and he also tested there was no i mean they didn't see that uh, didn't see any significant problems and uh, this is the uh, finding as you see here child had pretty much normal distance vision but i was seeing that the child was struggling to read and the near cover test showed four exophoria the father had uh, done npc for this child of course and because when they did the npc they found that it was receding so what they did is over the last three months they had given convergence training for this child and the symptoms did not improve at all and then they said okay the 
there is no improvement in symptoms and this is not convergence issue also so what is, what is the issue so they brought the child to us and when we tested the near points of accommodation we found that the near points of accommodation were grossly uh, you know receded and it was uh, very much lesser for the age so if you all like calculate the 20 centimeters converted into diopters it comes to five diopters and uh, so the expected uh, amplitude of accommodation for the age based on the hofstetter's formula as you would know is just 13 dia is 13 diopters but this child has just five diopters and so it's very very less so when you see that monocular accommodation amplitudes are two diopters lesser than the minimum that is expected based on the formula that we have shown here then you have to start thinking if the child has an accommodative insufficiency now this child has an accommodative insufficiency basically but the child is treated for convergence insufficiency because no one tested the near points of accommodation because the assumption is that young children will have good accommodation amplitudes and so what we did next is uh, we are going to ask you what you will do for this child. And so let's go back now that we have good number of participants. In the chat box, you will see a link. You will also see a code. And that is going to take you to uh, this uh, page. So what I want you to do is for this child who is uh, you know, having difficulty reading, what uh, further assessments you will do you can click more than one option but what i want you to do is grade like choose which one you will do first which you will do second which you will do third and which you will do fourth okay so so rate uh, based on your preference what would you do first second third and fourth okay so please go ahead and do. Uh, i would request all the participants to go to the following link displayed in the screen with the code and give their opinion based on these questions available there. So go to menti.com, use the code. Again, nothing right or wrong. Do not get scared. Just sort of whatever you feel like, please go ahead and click it. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Like that's that's so as you see here, the most like many you want to do the positive relative accommodation first and then they want to do the monocular estimation method then they want to do accommodative facility and then they want to do cycloplegic okay so this is the order that people are preferring so as more and more people answer we we will see if this order gets changed okay the order of uh, yeah, testing. yeah dr rijwana in, uh, when when i approach to pediatric patient uh, i do the monocular testing first then i go to the binocular testing I think so that should be the standard or is there <laughs> something else? Yeah, so I will answer because now that people are answering it, I don't want to bias their approach. So I want to understand how generally optometrists do, like what is their preference. But of course, I have the uh, the preferred approach, uh, which I will share. Can, you, can right? you see the response as well? Can we see the response as well? Oh, oh you are not seeing the response on second. No, we can, uh, we can just see the PPT that you are, you are sharing. Can you see the response? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, 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 it's loading the screen. Okay, okay. Yeah, now we can see. Now we can see. Okay. Yeah. PRA, Cyclo, Monoclo. Yeah, cy Cyclo went first something. now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, one minute yeah. before Cyclo was at the last. <laughs> Now cyclo went yeah, yeah. followed by yeah yeah we'll we'll discuss on that we'll discuss on that yeah yeah sure okay so as you keep thinking what I'm going to do is go over to the presentation and continue because of which I just uh, have five more minutes to go so okay so basically as uh, many of you have put this is the key information of course we did a dynamic retinoscopy we found that the lack of accommodation is really was large so plus 0.25 to plus 0.75 is the normal uh, range uh, in the lack of accommodation that you would expect especially considering the age this lack of accommodation is really high and then the child also had difficulty with minus lenses on monocular accommodative facility testing and the child just could not stimulate accommodation at all but what is the first step that you will have to do is basically okay this is a little bit uh, thing about uh, 
the uh, uh, MEM retinoscopy. But before we decide, like, you know, uh, Pratyush was asking, what will you do first? I think you need to have some sort of a thought process about, so what is the tentative diagnosis that I am thinking for this case? So this child primarily has a, has a reduced near points of accommodation as well as receded NPC. But looks like primarily the issue is more accommodative in nature because you see that the difficulty is more with uh, minus lenses. The child has large lack of accommodation. So what are the potential possibilities? It could be uncorrected hyperopia, ill sustained accommodation, accommodative insufficiency or convergence insufficiency along with the accommodation. So the first thing, as you all rightly said, is to do a cycloplegic refraction. We did a cycloplegic refraction and then uh, we got a plus 1.5. We used borage delay testing to binocularly push as much plus as possible. And after we gave the plus one, a week after when we did the review, we found that the NPA and NPC showed significant improvement. The near exophoria did not worsen at all because many people fear that the near exophoria will become worsened with plus lenses. But as you know, if you have an accommodative issue primarily, then the near exo may not worsen. So definitely the next thing is to go ahead and do a uh, prescribe the hyperopic glasses and also to try vision therapy as in the sequential phase. So the goal uh, is... I would like to add a little on this, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Izwana, sorry to interrupt you. Sure, so sure. many of uh, yeah, many of them might be thinking why we are preferring doing the cycloplasty refraction first without doing the binocular, you know, testing or some other kind of testing. So uh, we do cycloplasty refraction before uh, refraction before doing any of other tests so that we know the exact uh, refractive error of the patient. Since the patient is a child patient, his accommodation is her accommodation might be fluctuating so we first do cycloplegic refraction get the exact refractive error of the patient then only we do further any other uh, orthoptic test or a binocular test that's because if you uh, don't predict or if you don't get the refractive error uh, exact correct refractive error to the patient doing binocular testing or any other test is worthless I mean, we require that patient to be a emetropic first, make that patient a emetrope, then we do further binocular testing or an orthopedic evaluation or some other kind. Uh, correct me, Dr. Rizwana, if I'm wrong, please. No, you are absolutely right. The reason why I showed the binocular vision test is only as a clinician for us to know where the child is without the hyperopic prescription. The second thing is, for us to know, okay, how much of a hyperopic prescription will really help because a plus one diopter for an eight year old could be considered absolutely normal and many practitioners would start off defer uh, or defy from giving the prescription. So if you want to decide oh, how much plus should I prescribe, what is the accommodative status of this child to really begin with as a baseline, not to do your vision therapy or not to use that as some sort of like, you know, diagnostic information. But where is this child to begin with? It's only as a clinician for you to know before I prescribe, this is the MEM lag. And after I prescribe, this is how things change. But I totally agree that accommodation could be wacky, it could be fluctuating and all that. But for us as clinicians to get into the sort of diagnostic process, oh, am I dealing really with an accommodation problem or a convergence problem? Because I told you that the father has been treating the child for convergence issues. So to convince the father who's an ophthalmologist, we have to show in convergence issue, the child will not have difficulty with minus lenses. And for us also to get convinced that, okay, this hyperopic prescription is going to restore the NPAs and NPCs and how things are changing, it really like you can decide to do bare minimum information. Like if you see, I did not go ahead and did and do the full battery of binocular vision test. I only showed you the bare minimum information that is required for you as a clinician to jump and take the decision making with more confidence. That's all. So otherwise, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Yes. 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 I agree with that. At the same time, I would request you to you know cover up your presentation so that we have our next presenter ready yeah, we yeah are sure a sort of <laughs> those yeah yeah sure I'm so done. just I'm... requesting you to have some conclusion uh, concluding yeah concluding uh, information for your presentation thank you Dr. you want to please go ahead thanks so i'm done 
so this is what is the whole thing and if you want to read more about the management aspects then you could go and read about read the paper that i have cited in here so we did the hyperopic glasses and we did the accommodative flipper based training after like three uh, months of refractive adaptation we started the child with facility exercises and we also provided other visual hygiene thing so the basic thing like because pratyush was asking me it this is the conceptual framework that could help clinician which is first to understand the symptoms then you get the refraction right get your cyclopegic refraction done do your prescription but also you could use some basic bv framework to come to a diagnosis okay so with that what i'm going to do is to just go over to my uh, uh this information which is you could go and read this paper where if you are really like you know what going to take a lot of time to do a full binocular vision workup you could do this you could read this and use this minimum battery to screen for problems these are my references and just that women's day is coming up uh i am like a sort of like you know uh, a strong follower of my angelo so i'm grateful to be a woman and uh, wishing all the women participants who are here and of course all the men who support them a very happy international women's day as it's just up to morning that's all and then thank you thank you so much uh, dr ijuana uh, it was really really uh, valuable session i believe to all the participants they were there and uh, whenever it comes to a pediatric optometry or a pediatric refraction it's it's always challenging i i take that as a challenge to upgrade myself to get few more new details you know from the patients how i can correlate those because they are child they can't respond so good to your uh, vision screen they can't respond good to your refraction retinoscopy they can't uh, respond uh, uh, better with the you know binocular test and everything and all where where we have all to correlate all the findings that we you know find within those test has been done within our clinics so it was really really a great uh, great presentation i would say i think many of the participation they gained a uh, new knowledge from your presentation dr ijwana and uh, uh, as i said earlier pediatric refraction is a not an easy job though there are lot of challenges but as an optometrist yes we are always ready to to take up the new challenges whatever comes to us clinically so i think it was a great presentation and uh, you will will connect you i'll i'll connect with you dr ijwana for possible research collaboration in uh, after we finish all this conference and around i'll get back to you email so we can collaborate in some kind of research that we we'll do in the coming years based in this clinical optometry and based on this pediatric optometry thank, <laughs> thank you. you thank you so much dr jamil dr jamil rizwana thank you so much for your valuable time and uh, valuable expertise and opinion on the pediatric refraction thank you so much you can now can stop your video uh, so thank you so much